First and foremost, I'd like to thank Mohan Rao and the team uh, at ISOLA uh, for inviting me to present my work and participate in this two-day event. Uh, my work on Ganga has been over a decade in the making, and it's an honor to share it with all of you today. Uh, I arrived in Allahabad over a decade ago, where I not only began to map and document the changes taking place at the confluence of the Ganga and Jamuna rivers of the Sangam, but also to begin to map the Ganga uh, basin by foot and boat, uh, as well as by car, armed only with a digital camera and a handheld GPS unit. Now, I thought it would take me uh, one year to complete this project, but instead it took over a decade. Now, uh, today I'll speak about a small fragment of the 25,000 photographs that I took, the 15 sketchbooks, the 1,000 plus journal entries, and the 350 or so maps that I made over this decade-long project, uh, which has taken the form of op-eds in the New York Times and the Indian Express, to a traveling exhibition uh, here pictured at uh, Harvard, uh, to, a bit, to a book, all of which I hope can serve as a guidebook on how best to address the efforts underway by the government of India as well as the World Bank. Now, and I mention these things uh, because I think it's really important to think about the different modes and mediums in which we communicate our ideas, not just through drawings and through uh, texts amongst ourselves as professionals, but also uh, within the kind of larger uh, public sphere. Now, as my grandfather told me growing up, there are three types of people in this world, those who can count and those who cannot. So for this reason, I'm going to read a small portion of this work and then explain a number of the maps so that I don't get carried away. And also because we've had five minutes, I think, shaved away from our time up here. So beyond the urban density of Mumbai and the technology centers of Bangalore and Hyderabad lies the Ganga River Basin a fertile alluvial region of 1.1 million square kilometers in area, which is today home to over one quarter of India's billion plus population. Now most of the basin uh, sits within India, but it also extends into present day Bangladesh, Nepal, and Tibet. The area is one of the most densely populated river basins in the world, as so many of you know, uh, and undergoes these radical physical changes of state every year, which I will talk about uh, momentarily, and which is where the uh, title of my talk comes from. So with the arrival of the southwest monsoon between late June and late August, over one meter of rainfall drenches northern India. Remarkably, despite these drastic seasonal changes and high population density, the basin remains agriculturally productive. And this is in many ways why I came to India to map the Ganga in the first place in 2005, before Google Earth was even launched, because I could find no maps of this territory, yet I knew it was one of the most densely populated river basins in the world and agriculturally productive. So I thought, what does that look like uh, for a designer to be able to better understand the kind of complexity and the mosaic of, of uh, urbanization, of uh, cities, of agriculture, of infrastructure in this area? So this 10-year uh, research project focuses on the overlaps and juxtapositions of these three conditions, which is to say population density, um, monsoon agriculture. And it is an atlas of built and unbuilt projects designed to transform the Ganges River Basin. Now, since the middle of the 19th century, this water course has functioned as a laboratory to test and build a new civilization around, water, around the culture of water management. Jointly authored by human actors and their shifting natural heritage, the Ganges River Basin today is a machine in which the entire basin functions as a highly engineered hydrological supersurface. And this image that you have here, the bottom uh, is the, uh, the basin. Uh, the, the second uh, kind of exploded layer is the, the basin itself. And here you can see the red on the third from the bottom is rain-fed irrigation. And on the top is irrigated uh, agriculture, which uh, I'll get to in a second. But this is a kind of major uh, argument that I make throughout the book and I'll speak about today, is this notion of a supersurface. And the surf surface has been constructed from innumerable interventions operating at vastly different scales, from massive, uh, from massive interventions operating at different scales, from the massive state-sponsored canals to individually drilled tube wells and hand pumps. Because of the mixture of actors, the scale of inhabitation, and the widely varying techniques of interventions, Visualizing this landscape of infrastructure requires a different kind of atlas. Now, since 1854, 
When water from the Ganges was, uh, river was first redirected into the Ganges Canal, irrigation has reshaped the built environment of the Ganga River Basin. Over the past 160 years, the main trunks and branches of colossal canals have been cut through cities and hamlets. Brick-lined water tanks uh, were uh, embedded deep in the ground to capture rainwater. And countless small diameter uh, shallow tube wells have been connected to miniature engine-driven water pumps. These interventions have served in turn to reorient people's uh, thinking about the environment. And the irrigation infrastructures transform spaces from home to the region, often in unforeseen ways. They fostered agriculture and factories, hydroelectric dams, uh, transportation, and new patterns of settlement, while further blurring the distinction between rural and urban. And this is a point that I'm going to keep coming back to in terms of uh, this division, this, I think, false division between rural and urban. Now, by 1950, <clears throat> India was not only independent from British imperial rule, but her leaders encouraged the proliferation of irrigation infrastructure far beyond the ambitions of the imperial regime. Forged in the crucible of colonialism and nurtured by the new republic, these canals, tube wells, pumps, and adjoining buildings, roadways and railways had become something entirely new. Now, <clears throat> of all of the ways one might qualify this new space, rural, urban, landscape, drawscape, edge city, and megalopolis, none of these accurately defines such elaborately engineered spaces and infrastructures. A sociological term, such as we're urban, first used by social scientists in the 1960s uh, to describe continuities between cities and villages, does not adequately identify the conditions of the Ganga River Basin. Now, from the foothills of the Himalayas to the Bay of Bengal, the, the Ganges machine cuts across agricultural fields, cities, and hamlets, inscribing in its monumental reorganization of space and infrastructure a new way of life. And throughout this transformation, uh, transformed river basin flowed the forces of tradition and innovation, dotted by diffuse urban projects or regional urban capitals, temporary tent cities like Mag and Kummelas in Allahabad, miniature infrastructures of tube wells, and uh, colossal public works projects like the Ganges Canal. Its spiritual and religious significance inspired reverence in pilgrims. Its archaeological and architectural ruins attracted painters in search of the picturesque. Its seasonal ebb and flow of water perplexed farmers and engineers alike. And its fast-paced urbanization vexed geographers, planners, and architects. In short, the physical and cultural complexity of this territory has challenged traditional terminology. Now, despite this remarkable background, the infrastructural and architectural projects of the Ganga River Basin have received comparatively little study, with a few notable exceptions. One in particular, which is worth mentioning, is the Ganges Water Machine, which appeared in a special food issue of Science Magazine in 1975. Authored by Roger Ravel, director of the Harvard Center for Population Studies, and V. Lakshmi Narayana, an assistant professor of civil engineering at IIT Kanpur, the article designated what others had yet cl to claim since the opening of the Ganga Canal 121 years earlier. All of the seemingly disparate and incoherent efforts to transform the basin were finally given a name. But with the exception of their title, the authors did not once mention the word machine. Instead, they concerned themselves with low productivity and poor management. They noted that, quote, deeply embedded cultural, social, and economic problems inhibit modernization of agriculture and fuller utilization of the water resources. No maps or illustrations of how to increase productivity and improve management of the basin accompanied their article. Only equations and diagrams documented how best to utilize and promote conjunctive irrigation of what they said was, quote, one of Earth's great natural resources. The Ganges Machine paper was a technical paper for scientists and international development specialists. Now, this book uh, that I've published is a different interpretation of that machine. The river basin that, that was transformed into one of the most engineered spaces on the planet. It draws together the moving parts of the machinery uh, outlined by Ravel and Lakshmi Narayana, but it also looks at the individuals and stories uh, that contributed to, um, to this landscape and to the construction of this robust, mat uh, robust matrix of population density, monsoon, and agriculture. Part of that involves what novelist Joseph Conrad called map gazing, which brings the problems of the great spaces of the earth into stimulating and directive contact with the sane curiosity and gives an honest precision to one's imaginative faculty. Now, part of this uh, act of map gazing entails closely inspecting infrastructure. 
Now this book is an atlas, what I call a dynamic atlas of the Ganga machine, a collection of transects that expose the juxtaposing layers of infrastructure and adjoining built forms. The book is subdivided into four sections, starting with the Himalayas and ending in the historic city uh, here, uh, starting in Gangotri, ending in the historic city of uh, Varanasi. And not just looking at the ebb and flow of the Ganga like you see here in these images over the course of four days, uh, but also that illustrate how the supersurface is a continuous infrastructure of both water management and risk management. And the development of these infrastructures is largely a story of linear in, uh, succession, from monumental public works, projects like the Ganga Canal, still growing in length today, to the miniature scale of the tube well, whose exact number and distribution remains purely speculative. And while at first blush, the development of these technologies is linear, going to large, from large top-down approaches of canals to small bottom-up approaches of tube wells, the story is in fact anything but a linear succession of technological innovation. Instead, it is a story of how these technologies, it's a story of how these technologies were layered over one, ano over one another, often in unexpected ways, and how their built forms shaped the land. Canals of the 19th century were not abandoned once tube wells became popular in the early 20th century. On the contrary, as tube wells proliferated across the basin, new canals and even mega pumping stations, like this that you see here at the Naranpur pumping mega station, were built across the Ganga Basin. Now, the, Gun the Ganga Basin is best viewed as five distinct modes of irrigation. Rivers, canals, tanks and lakes, pumps and tube wells. At different times, of the year, these infrastructures compete, coexist, and occasionally feed off of one another. Now, a cut through these five layers reveals a lamination of infrastructural ide ideologies born out of the discontinuities of politics, bureaucracies, and cultural practices. And even though these ubiquitous infrastructures affect millions in their daily lives, there is no map that legibly renders their built reality or the relationships they produce. Now, it might be worth asking, what use are detailed map, cartographic maps of a territory transformed into a machine. Geographers, surveyors, and hydrographers are not trained to draw plans and sections of machines. This is the job of engineers, landscape architects, and architects. Is this perhaps why the Survey of India has not mapped this hydrological supersurface in over 45 years? I have to wonder, did each survey general and each generation of bureaucrats agree that static, stale cartographic conventions of representation could not compete with infrastructure embedded in the ground. To make matters more complicated, over the last 45 years, the basin's exploding population has produced new clusters of settlement along existing roads and railways, although the basin has nevertheless remained largely agrarian. Who can blame the Survey General for not wanting to trace the movements of a machine of such heterodoxy? Not to mention, how does one possibly map the territory where a meter of rainfall transforms parched earth into gelatinous silt? flooding and submerging thousands of kilometers of land every year. A dynamic basin such as this presents many challenges to cartographers and physical geographers. Even in an age of GPS and GIS, the Ganges uh, River Basin remains largely uncharted. A far older tradition, a uh, surveying tradition, and one that is more attuned to change and risk, is that of the Patra or Jantri, known in English as an almanac. An annual publication, the almanac plotted changes in the seasons, the positions of the celestial bodies, and noted the high and low tides for those aboard ships at sea. Now, one can find almanac makers today in nearly every town and city in northern India, as they have been for hundreds of years. Their job is to anticipate change. Now, if an almanac is literally a collection, or sorry, if, uh, if, an, alman if an almanac is a collection of calendars and astrological positions, and an atlas is literally a collection of maps. Then this book draws this dynamic, these dynamic conditions of people and weather, monsoon, along with agriculture and infrastructure. It draws both cyclical seasonal time, as an almanac would, and historical time, as an atlas would, since the interaction with the river is necessarily time-based. Now, the goal is to manifest time visually, to be able to see both the history and the cycles of the river to perceive it dynamically. If the supersurface is still in need of an atlas, almanac hybrid, a dynamic atlas, then this dynamic atlas once drawn should yield criteria for design that is once both dynamic and stable. There are any number of ways the dynamism of the Ganga River might have been interpreted since its beginnings in 1854. The forces that drove the development of the Ganges machine exploited these dynamic changes as signs of crises, 
floods, droughts, and lackluster uh, agricultural productivity were all used to justify technological intervention without ever once losing faith in technology to deliver a better managed modern future. After all, both dynamism and crisis are related because they both deal with time and probability. Now, if there's a way to understand the drive to construct the Ganges machine, it is through understanding the protagonist's sense that they should live not with, not with machines, but in the machine. They sought quite literally to reconstruct their environment into a machine the size of the basin itself. So without exception, the development of the Ganges machine was undertaken through the exploitation of crisis and trauma. And this is much of what I look at in the book. And most crises such as hurricanes, tornadoes, or earthquakes are instant or happen in a few days or weeks, but the transformation of the built environment into a water machine over the last two centuries has also produced a crisis of water exploitation that is occurring in slow motion. And the scale and ubiquity of this exploitation is not perceptible in everyday life. Given the complexity of the different phenomena from urbanization and agriculture to weather and infrastructure, its visibility, registration, and representation is complex. Now, a slow motion crisis of the scale and speed must be uh, rendered through measured drawings to be fully understood. And the difficulty of bringing the yearly cycles of the monsoon and expanding human settlement into the same picture plane as the hydrological systems of ground and surface water presents serious challenges to rendering the mixture of water, soil, and culture. Moving beyond these kind of uh, linear, static, and monoscale image making common to engineering, a dynamic modeling method might actually then lead to more attuned and synthesized based uh, methods of design and uh, development in these areas, especially within the context of such a dynamic system as the Ganga Basin. And finally, while most maps draw the rivers and canals of the Ganges Basin as a web of misshaped plumbing lines, what I look at are the ways in which you can use the transect to expose water across, uh, as it exists m above the surface of the land as it does below. Much uh, drawing upon the work of, say, someone like Alexander von Humboldt in the transect as a visual technique that was further developed by Patrick Geddes, much in the context of India, and that draws a swath through the landscape, a kind of sectional sampling of the character character characteristic land uses. Now, von Humboldt uses the tool to better understand microclimates. Geddes and later Ian McCarg use it as both an analytical tool and an instrument of design. In this case, cutting transects exposes the many layers of the Ganga machine. Given the expansive nature of water and transportation, uh, it offers a promising method of surveying. And so this work in this book that I'm now going to talk about really uh, develops from trying to cut transects through this vast machine. Uh, and these are some of those transects that I'm going to talk about in just a second. And I start now where I'm going to kind of freeform it a little bit and tell you that this was actually, when I came to India, this was the best map that I could find of hydrological activity. Uh, it's incredibly difficult as a foreigner to get a hold of maps. I was asked more times than I can remember if I worked for the CIA. I, of course, told people that I did not work for any scary acronym-based uh, organizations. Not that I think if you worked for the CIA, you would. But I uh, was able to, unable to find any kind of up-to-date maps of the region. I could find city maps, like say this one of Patna that's from the 1980s, uh, but it was incredibly difficult to find maps of the territory outside of cities, or what was considered the city as a kind of political unit. And what I came to realize, that in the context of the Ganga Basin, it's actually not the cities, but actually the spaces outside of them that are the most contested, the most highly infrastructural, and in some ways the most uh, prone to conflict over over water resources. Now this was, when I arrived, uh, one of the best images I could find also in terms of satellite imagery, because again, Google Earth hadn't even been launched and the cost to purchase satellite would be, uh, satellite imagery would be extremely prohibitive. So I wrote a proposal to basically walk the land and to try to better understand the relationship of say, how the Ganga that you see up here as it takes a 90 degree turn and meets the Jamuna at Allahabad, the kind of difference that you see in just that river and water uh, regime versus say the Yamuna to the south. And here again you can start to see at the Sangam itself where I was based and lived uh, in Allahabad and I'll talk more about that in a moment of mapping this territory, the ways in which soils and silt, uh, but also the ways in which lines are drawn in this, uh, in this territory and the way in which they become erased over time. Now, to give you some sense of how hyper-engineered the Ganga Basin is, this is an image of the Amazon Basin. 
this is that kind of same diagram of looking at, okay, how much is rain fed and how much is uh, artificially irrigated. And you can see the rain fed in red uh, to your right and uh, the artificial at the top that there's almost none in the Amazon. Uh, the Danube, if you look at this river basin, again, you can see the amount of rain-fed uh, rain agriculture versus, say, um, uh, irrigated. We look at the Nile. The Nile, uh, there's quite a bit of rain-fed, but of course the infrastructure for artificial is so close to hugging the river that you can't even really perceive it at the top of the exploded axon. When we get into the Indus, we start to see the level of continuous irrigation that's happening in that area and it's one of them it's probably the second most hyper engineered surface and we get to the Ganga Basin which is in fact one of the most hyper engineered uh, and you can see that there is artificial irrigation happening all the way uh, connecting with the Indus all the way to the Bay of Bengal and it's not only fascinating that this is one of the most densely populated river basins in the world that, we've, uh, that, the, that the monsoon occurs here, but it also has one of the largest amounts and concentrations of uh, artificial irrigation in the world. On top of that, or rather below that, it also, the Ganga Basin, has one of the highest uh, groundwater potentials. The water table level is so low within the basin that uh, you can sometimes dig less than a meter to uh, access water, and this is in many ways responsible for, uh, or, or the transformation of this groundwater uh, basin uh, into an infrastructure for tube wells, which again I'll show in just a moment. So how, how do you bring these kind of subterranean or terrestrial layers into coordination or, in, or intersect with the celestial layers of the Ganga Basin? And of course, as Dilip was mentioning, there's the, uh, the, mon the monsoon, the ways in which uh, these tempestuous winds enter the subcontinent and the way that they uh, leave. And this is a mapping, and I won't go into too much detail about it, but about taking sections through those winds and the dynamism of that system. Uh, it, just then also, how do you start to better understand the topography of the, of the Ganga Basin? So here, cutting cross sections through it to give you a better sense of just the kind of small bowl that gets created between the Vindhya Hills and the uh, Himalayas. And then also, the ways in which rainfall is incredibly uh, diverse, dispersed, and never, uh, it's incredibly uneven across the basin. So here, a, a mapping of how rainfall takes place over the course of the year in relationship to these sections. And what I use within these is a single solar cycle. So I'm trying to map how the choreography of water transforms uh, this basin every year, how it goes from parched and, uh, parched and dry to wet and gelatinous, and the transformations that happen in relationship to section. And so here you can see I use a single solar cycle as a way to start to map how uh, this terrain changes over time and the ways in which the monsoon enters the subcontinent, leaves it, both the kind of uh, the wet and the dry, and the dispersion of that rainfall again within that uh, system. And taking it one step further, then how bringing the kind of agricultural productive production in relationship to uh, the solar cycle as well as to uh, lunar cycles in terms of cultural festivities. So trying to better understand these material and cultural practices and how they intersect with one another uh, and how they shape the space over time. But it's not only that. It also has to do with the ways in which people perceive this landscape. Uh, you know, these for me were some of the best or most telling images that I could find, this calendar art or bazaar art that you find, say, at the Sangam, where you have uh, Yamuna, Ganga, and Saraswati meeting, you have kind of terrestrial sites like Akbar Kila, uh, you know, the railway station um, and bridge, a series of mandirs that are placed throughout Kusro Bagh, um, bringing together this kind of celestial and terrestrial relationship, the ways in which I met so many people that did not perceive this river and they did think of it as a river. They did not perceive it as a kind of continuous moving body, but instead as a, as a constellation of, celestial, of sacred sites that are imbued with celestial significance. And I think uh, this is, of course, a very specific population, but I think it's important to think about the cultural meanings and the ways in which the kind of celestial and uh, terrestrial are drawn into one another. And then, of course, uh, most of the work that I did was mostly taking place uh, in uh, UP, what was once the United Provinces, and in particular, uh, the area around Allahabad and Varanasi, as well as the Doab, or the land between the Ganga and Jamuna rivers. 
Now, UP for me is a fascinating place and it's in many ways like a second home to me because I've spent so much time there. UP, if you just did the numbers, crunch the numbers in terms of population, it'd be the seventh most populous country in the world, yet it's an area the size of Great Britain. So if you imagine taking California, splitting it in half and putting 200 million people in it, which would be almost the population of the United States, that's UP alone. Um, it's the same size as, say, Great Britain. Brazil has a, a population that approaches uh, UPs, but Brazil has something like a couple million uh, square kilometers, whereas, the, uh, whereas UP only has 238,000 square kilometers. Now, if you just played a kind of numbers game and pushed everybody uh, either to the north, to the center, into a square, or a kind of Australia model living along the edges of UP, you'd see that the black is human settlement and the white is agriculture. To give you a sense of that, uh, with 200 million people, now of course it doesn't really look like this, but in fact uh, it's this kind of uh, incredibly uh, delicate mosaic of, of villages, of uh, cities, of towns, of, of, uh, of cities running throughout this. And well, that's recognized by the Indian government as a kind of uh, set of political um, units. What I'm going to show is the way in which, if you just think about urban and rural in terms of infrastructure, uh, access to infrastructure, what I hope to show you is that cities and uh, supposed uh, rural areas have almost the same exact uh, access to infrastructure in some ways, especially hydrological infrastructure. And of course, this is a kind of mosaic of what you find throughout the state in terms of its both pockets of density, like at Allahabad or Varanasi, versus some areas that are outside of these uh, cities and elsewhere. Now, I, I spoke about this formation of a supersurface, and that is in many ways tied to both the kind of colonial past of this area, but also to the five-year planning schemes. If you just were to take UP, and in the same way that I put the population in the center, if you were to look at how, if we put all of the artificial irrigation that takes place in the state and put it in the center over time, from the pre-plan area, which you have on the far left, all the way to the 1990s, you'd see the level of growth that's happened. And that growth that's also happened is both an extension of the canal systems that's in the lower portion of this drawing, and it's also with the exponential growth of tube well infrastructure in the state. Now, the formation of this supersurface super is um, very much tied to the Ganges Canal and other heroic projects. The Ganga Canal first opened 1854. It was the largest public works project ever attempted in human history. It was 854 miles long, stretching from Haridwar all the way down to Kanpur. Uh, it was full of uh, monumental works that had never really been attempted before, uh, tragically had never been attempted before uh, with respect to kind of rivers and uh, landscapes uh, such as this. It had the longest canal system, in the, or, sorry, the longest aqueduct passing over the Solani uh, Nadi in uh, Rurki. And this growth of this uh, supersurface in part uh, from the 1850s onward, the Gunga Canal went from 854 miles long to now stretching over 12,000 kilometers long. Uh, this kind of hydrological supersurface, it actually uh, creates a kind of grid-like structure, uh, say like a Jeffersonian grid in the United States. This creates almost a kind of uh, grid in terms of uh, hydrological infrastructure. And here you can see where the, the canal is actually uh, breaking away from the, or being the water is being siphoned away at, at Haridwar into the Ganga Canal. Uh, the ways in which the canal system both has rivers that sometimes cross over it and sometimes beneath it, like here. Here you can see a river actually passing over the canal system. The Solani Aqueduct um, is, uh, in Rurki. And What's interesting is that this project was never thought purely as just being an infrastructure of uh, irrigation. Uh, this section shows that there was actually an idea that the sectional relationships, there are shops that are actually flanking the edges of that section, uh, and there are roadways. So it was always seen as part of a kind of multi-layered infrastructural project. And of course, it was to, uh, the, the argument for this uh, monumental work was to actually uh, try to help with famine relief when in fact it was, uh, many historians would argue that it was in fact creating uh, tremendous amounts of food shortages within northern India. And 
here you can see the way in which that, that kind of grid-like structure or the chevron structure that starts to emerge from the ways in which the canals uh, or the, uh, the Rajbuhas that are uh, actually being taken off the, the main trunk of the canal uh, enter into the landscape. And it's not just that it's in supposedly rural areas, but it also passes through cities like Kanpur, like you can see here, where uh, many people live along it and use it both for drinking, for bathing, etc. And ultimately uh, then terminates at the city of Allahabad uh, today. Now, I want to do a kind of a little experiment in the time that I have left, which is to talk about this uh, notion of the transect and of using that solar cycle that I was mentioning to you before. So, uh, what I'm going to show are the ways in which I use a single solar cycle as a way to map change uh, within this area, particularly between Allahabad and Varanasi. And so these transects are those slivers that you see with the purple running in them. And I'll explain what that purple means in relationship to the solar cycle in a moment. But if we just play a silly game of bound city versus unbound city, with the bound city being Allahabad and Varanasi and the unbound city being that area in between, if we take a city like Allahabad, which is pictured here at the bottom, uh, and this is a map that I had to make of the city because the last map was from 1956, uh, you can see the way in which the Ganga expands and contracts over the course of a singular solar cycle. So what I've done is I had to do all of this by foot and by boat. I map how the Ganga uh, expands and contracts over the course of that single solar cycle, and I bring that in relationship to uh, photographing at those same times the Triveni Sangam or where the Ganga, Jamuna and Saraswati meet. So here is a kind of zoom in of that and you can see the way in which the Ganga is sometimes so shallow that you can cross it. It's maybe six, seven meters wide. It then goes to sometimes three and four kilometers wide and that river goes from being almost a kind of narrow rivulet to being a kind of stain or splotch. And that kind of stain or splotch is really important in thinking about how we render this territory um, the changes that take place, and also the ways in which people interact and uh, develop a choreography with this and make use of it. Now, uh, these are photos that are taken at the Sangam over the course of a single solar cycle. And uh, what I've done below is I show the kind of gridded structure of a city that's created from Magmela at the, um, at the confluence. You can see the photograph uh, here, the second kind of panorama. And then once that city is abandoned, uh, and this is a drawing from 2005, 2006, uh, the gridded city is then used for agriculture. So there's this transformation from an incredibly dense and populated city to an agrarian or bucolic landscape. Uh, the, the crops are harvested, uh, the uh, monsoon starts, the, the waters start to set in, and then all of those islands that you saw before are completely subsumed by the monsoon. And in many ways, this is a microcosm of what happens all along the Ganga. Uh, uh, both its edges, but also throughout m much of the basin itself as a kind of watershed. And so here then bringing that kind of, so you can begin to picture both uh, kind of pictorially and cartographically the transformations that take place at this area. And of course here, uh, the uh, Magmaela de Lahavad. And then here's some images from the Kum uh, from 2013. And uh, fortunately, because I'm not in front of a bunch of uh, Firungis, I don't have to explain this. You all know what this is. It's quite nice. I can move through it rather quickly. Um, and, the, you know, the, these are photographs from just the Magmela setup in 2005, 2006. The level of infrastructure that's put in place, you can see the bulldozing to, to make way for what is considered the most sacred site, right, within Hinduism, where these two rivers and the third river meet. And here you see that city that was once there, the agriculture uh, is hugging the edges, the water table level is so high that, there's, um, uh, that you can just dig hand wells uh, to, uh, to uh, grow crops. And this happens throughout the year. You can see the tattoo of the, of the tents that are there. And it's an incredibly intelligent way of using the dynamism of the river as a system. Um, and is in many ways the genesis or the kind of Rosetta Stone of them what I look at throughout the entire book. And not only that, it's a kind of recreation and bathing space as well as spaces for pujas, right? We see animal husbandry happening along any number of other uh, events. It's of course also a resource, the, the, the mining of sand, I know that was uh, uh, extracting was in the, is oftentimes in the news, especially up in Delhi. Um, and 
trying to understand how this river has changed over time, especially at the, at the Sangam, uh, because of all of the infrastructures that have been put in place further upstream. So this is a mapping of those changes over the course of the last 200 years from the maps that I was able to find to then making my own maps. And here at the bottom, kind of superimposing, you can see the ways in which the, the, the Ganga has kind of consistently moved over time that the Yamuna has, for the most part, stayed relatively the same, and a lot of that has to do with kind of uh, silt load, water budget, etc., that uh, comes from it, especially because of all the damming that happens uh, around Delhi, um, and even uh, above, and especially above the Chumbul. Now, this is an image from 1956 of Allahabad, and then this is a map, actually it should say 2006, that I had to make, and again, I had to do all of this uh, by myself. This is not like a GIS uh, or a tracing of uh, a satellite image. This is all me doing kind of old school surveying. You can see that there's a kind of growth or change uh, in this lens, in this city, both uh, not just in terms of the changes in the river, but also this kind of growth east to west. Um, here, kind of the changes in the river, the changes in street structures that have happened, there's no big surprises there. Railways, again, not much of it. But the settlement patterns, it's quite incredible the level of settlement change that's happened in this area, uh, especially as you can see to the east uh, of the Ganga. You can see that agriculture has also been mostly pushed to the edges of the, of the city, what was once kind of spots in it. Uh, the, the tanks, lakes, uh, many of these are actually created, the new ones that you're seeing is mostly from water logging, uh, it's from infilling uh, kind of low-lying areas. And then these were just the tube wells that I could count, but you can see on the right the kind of constellation or galaxy of tube wells that are placed throughout this area that have completely transformed the landscape that allows for the diffuse urbanization to take place in an area like this, which is able to support a lot of these areas outside of the city, but even in the city proper because the municipality is not able to provide uh, water for it, like many uh, cities in northern India. It's unable to keep up pace. Now if we take that idea of the bound city and then think about the kind of changes that happen in this unbound city, again in those transects, those six transects, if I just take apart those six transects in terms of their layers, you see here the way in which the Ganga expands and contracts much like uh, you know, a kind of stain or a splotch or as a rivulet. We can see the kind of roadways that are uh, inscribed within it. The settlement, the diffuse settlement that exists within this area, which is important, especially pay attention to these three transects to your right you'll see that there's a vast amount of tanks uh, uh, on the f uh, three left-hand uh, transects and very few on the right. Yet, you'll, if you remember, there's still a fair amount of settlement that's happening in those areas. There are also you know, the kind of drains, nalas, uh, canal systems that are there. There are some that are on those three transects to the right, but not that many. And we take all of those layers together and start to look at them. And what's happening is that those in those three areas, you can see that there's an uh, inordinate number of tube wells that are supporting this kind of uh, diffuse urbanization that's taking place in this area. It's a transformation of the groundwater uh, uh, system, which uh, has sometimes been called the silent Saraswati of uh, northern India by a, actually a British engineer in the 1940s. This transformation or thinking of uh, the groundwater as a kind of infrastructure to build uh, cities, uh, to support farms, to support villages, etc. It's this transformation of the landscape. And I not only then look at ways of trying to picture and bring those layers together, but also developing methods of mapping those changes as they happen over time. And these drawings, they developed from uh, an instrument that I developed in 2002 of mapping how uh, a river expands and contracts along its Thalweg using this kind of machine that I call a flexi Thalweg uh, mapping instrument from 2002 of the ways in which you can start to plot uh, how uh, if uh, you draw lines perpendicular to a river's edge and then start to straighten it or bend it, the way that that indexes its curvature over time and also the ways in which it creates different deposits of sediment uh, and of different systems. And so that was a, a method of drawing that I developed uh, uh, for the Charles River, and I use that uh, in this context to then start to map out uh, the, the changes that happen along this river edge. So if you have that red line, the Thalweg, and imagine you have these perpendicular lines that cross through it, if you take that Thalweg and you straighten it, 
you get an index of the curvature, which are those lines that are radiating off the middle drawing and the, and the third one to your right. And so you start to then be able to map not only how the river expands and contracts as a kind of river bed, but also uh, its relationship to its geometry. And so I do that and I take that not only for all six so you can compare and contrast them, but also start to do that in terms of the topography uh, in relationship to both plan and section. And I won't go into too much detail about these. And then take that transect even further and start to develop it and hone in on the ways in which the groundwater table level and the river level are intertwined or imbricated with one another and the ways in which farmers are using that uh, relationship in order to adjust and uh, modify their environments, oftentimes in very small ways. Now, a lot of these drawings that I made, because I couldn't be in the entire basin at once and I was an army of one, uh, I hadn't started teaching at RISD or Columbia University yet, so I had to make these machines, uh, or these what I call a surface accumulation sleeve, to map how the uh, river expands and contracts over a single year. So I uh, did this by developing uh, a system of taking the particle size, it's a, it's a very kind of almost uh, homemade way of doing it, a kilometer perpendicular to the river to start to pick up the soils, collect those, and then begin to um, analyze them, break them down, so you can begin to say the ways in which sediment is dispersed over uh, this territory uh, over time. And not only that, because I was hypersensitive to trying to get soils outside of India to bring them back uh, for an exhibition I was creating, I also then uh, was taking imprints uh, with uh, what I call the Ganga dip sock. And so what I did was to take these sediments, I would basically be uh, trolloping through the, the basin and the river edge to try to collect soils. And the idea was that I would bring back, you know, 100 or so dirty socks. And if I met the USDA and they asked me, why are you bringing these in? I would just say that I was a filthy backpacker uh, in India and I didn't want to do my laundry as a way of bringing soils into the country. So trying to find different ways of mapping and bringing soil and picturing this landscape and uh, the, those relationships. And I, I won't go into too much detail because I am now at, uh, at a lot of time is over. So I'll just say that uh, the book really focuses then on this change from surface to section and the way in which the tube well has introduced an entirely new actor within this landscape uh, that's radically transforming it. Uh, from you know, the ubiquity of these to when you see the countless uh, advertisements for tube wells uh, throughout the basin to images like this. And in a place like UP, they estimate that there's between three and five million tube wells. Because they're unregulated, nobody knows how many there are or where they're at. So trying to develop water policies or, or policies towards groundwater extraction and surface water management is incredibly difficult in, in a terrain like this when you don't have access to that. So instead, using mapping and modeling as a way to better picture this landscape and understand, for example, then uh, the relationship between, say, a, um, a pumping system that's localized versus, say, the Naranpur pumping station that you see here, to give you some ex idea, that's a five foot five tall man in white just at the bottom of those pipes. This is the largest pumping station in Asia. Um, and it was actually near here where a group of Naxal women, I think they were Naxals, uh, came up to me with machine guns wanting to know what it was that I was doing in this area. And I was, you know, in my broken Hindi at that point, I was, first words that came out of my mouth were, Ab Kadesh Bohut Sundar hai? And that's what they did. They laughed at me. I mean, they had their guns trained on me and they lowered them. And, uh, but I think, I want to end with this image because I think it's incredibly powerful that this, what is the largest pumping station in Asia, and it was right just here where they approached me, that this was at one time considered controlled by Naxals, I think speaks to the, the, the risk and, the, and the, the tensions that exist within these large areas of, of hydrological infrastructure and the management of these. And that in many ways the most contested areas, I would say, in the Ganga Basin are not the typical cities, but actually those areas that are thought to be rural. Um, and uh, to conclude, I think it's important to try to bring these different scales or modes of representation of mapping time uh, together to be able to develop policy uh, as well as projects that can actually be realized. And I think it's incredibly important to draw this vast network of infrastructure because it's there. The, 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 the time it would take to undo all of that would be so great. Yet I think that there's a way of like a martial artist would work of trying to use these infrastructures for the, for the good and their bad uh, in a way turning them in on themselves to better develop these areas. Um, thank you.